Welcome to episode 29 of Women Seeking Wholeness. This is Cherie Burton, and I'm your host. This is a podcast for women who long to feel, express, and be who they truly are. I am just thrilled to be launching this Mary Magdalene series. I have wanted to interview Sarah Beek, and her name is spelled S-E-R-A, for a very long time. I don't think it was any accident how I happened upon her work. And it's a little controversial, I'll be honest, but you know what? I ate it up. There were pieces of it that just resonated so deeply in my soul that I felt like I had met a soul sister. I had met someone who speaks my language and had it was, was kind of speaking to the longings of my heart. And she actually was really pivotal in some of the shifts that I've made over the last year or so. She also led me to the work of Marion Woodman, who has since passed away, but was a powerful, I want to say feminist scholar. She was very embodied and Sarah will talk in our discussion about her experience with meeting Marion. Mary Magdalene is a very fascinating character. Everyone seems to have an opinion, you know, theologians, scholars, researchers, the average you know, Christian church, many different institutions and systems see her in different ways. What I'm learning about her is that she needs to be experienced. And this is what Sarah has brought to me through her writings, that organic feminine, just that natural, free, sovereign soul that just longs to have expression and to be heard and seen and honored. So her mission to be a heretic here <laughs> is, is kind of where we're, what we're heading into. And heretic in the most reverent sense of that word, if it can be reverent, because things need to change. Old patriarchal authority systems and control just aren't working for people anymore, both for men or women or children. So she is going to share with us the trinity of true love. I encourage you to go to my site, shereeburton.com. You can read some of our show notes under the podcast check out my products, check out my online courses. There's so much power in answering the call of your soul and certain teachers and certain people will show up in your lives at the very most perfect opportune time for you to wake up to who you are. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you for taking the time for this discussion. I've been so excited. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor to speak with you and to be here on this podcast. Ah, well, I think our listeners are in for a treat because I'm guessing not a lot of them have seen your work or heard about you. And I'm just going to start there because how I found you <laughs> is so insane. <laughs> I'll just share the story. So, and you know this well to everybody else. So last year, last fall, early fall, I was experiencing some real severe crises inside of me, little earthquakes. And as Tori Amos would say, but um, I recognize now from your work and others that it was soul sickness. And so I remember I was at a, I was at a convention for my business and I was in the bathroom, in the hotel bathroom getting ready. And I have, Somebody sent me a, a YouTube link about something and it was related to some, anyway, you show up <laughs> and I don't remember the name of the YouTube and I will find it though. Was it something about trembling? Like, what was it? Um, well, th- there's a few. Um, one is called Burn Baby Burn and the other one is um, In All Fears and Trembling Bolt. That one. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and I, first of all, it was like, oh, she's really pretty. Um, then you started talking and I was like, oh boy. And my soul was like, listen in, honey. So I did. And I took some notes and I'm just going to share a part of what you, you said, because I still, it was actually right here in front of me. I got my, I've got my little notebook that I had September, 2018. Uh, You had said it's a sacred duty to be yourself, to become saturated with your own soul and fully embodied. I was like, okay. And anyway, but this is the quote that I love that you said. You said patriarchy is now wearing a goddess costume in a feminine empowerment suit with high heels. Like Jesus in the temple overturning the merchandise dolls and exposing the charlatans. We modern women championing this new feminine movement have the opportunity to take a stand to say, not in our mother's house. Woo-hoo. I actually paused YouTube like five times so I could write the whole thing out. 
<laughs> Tell me, I mean, we're going to start a little bit with your journey as a young girl and sort of your background around spirituality and God and goddess. But um, I'm really curious about how with this new feminine paradigm that, that I've been so passionate about, and I know you have too, but kind of talking about how there's, there's a compulsion to commoditize the divine feminine and she does not want to be. Yeah. Yeah. And that was something that you awakened me to. So can we start there a little bit and then we'll come, we're, we'll circle back and go to your girlhood. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, what I've learned personally is just whenever something true starts to naturally arise out of all of us and out of the collective consciousness, things that have been in control try to stay in control. And one of the ways they do that is by co-opting or even mimicking this new truth that is gaining power. And in this particular case, we're talking about the divine feminine. And I often refer to it as the organic feminine. Mm. This is, you know, a wild and free and sovereign, natural feminine. And so this is something that exists inside every human and it exists in this universe. And so as we're all really familiar with, you know, patriarchy has been the system of power that has been in control and it has repressed women and men it's 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 all of us it suppresses anything that is alive and true and specifically feminine which again we all hold and so that's because the feminine's been rising and because patriarchy wants to stay in control one of his clever means has been to commodify the feminine, make her a brand, make her a product, make her something sexy and sellable with a flashy website, expensive courses. I mean, there's many different ways to do it. But for me, how I came about this was that I was starting to go down that route with my career and with a real sincere and honest devotion towards the feminine. But what's out there is such a strong current to commodify. And we do live in a capitalistic culture that there are parts of me that were unconsciously succumbing to that and that were actually, you know, carrying out patriarchy's agenda. Even though I was taking this fierce stand for the feminine publicly and professionally. So it was a huge, huge, huge humbling awakening that I was doing that. And so I really had to change a tremendous amount in my professional and personal life in order to uh, just start listening to how she wanted to come through naturally and organically without all this other stuff trying to glom onto her (laughs) and to protect her, you know, to to do my part in um, protecting my little piece of the feminine. I love that. And because I have studied leadership for so long, it's it's typically very male driven. All the paradigms around leadership are male centric. Yeah. Yeah. And I really got to a point in my business, even though it's very healer based, you know, really women led business as women, we were inserting ourselves into these success formulas and it felt really, it started to feel like, Oh, I can set, you know, there's literally like a book called Mach 3 with your hair on fire or something like that. (laughs) I'm like, uh, this is not working so well. I have kids. I'm um, trying to run a home-based business because I want to be with them. And also within my being, Mm -hmm. it's not feeling aligned anymore to have this achievement paradigm, even though it's really, really ingrained in me. It's who I am. I'm, I'm a high achiever by nature. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, how do I bring this back? Because I mentor people in my business and they also are all women and they are most of them mothers and real spiritual people. And so it's become sort of this um, crisis that 
we're trying to navigate how to, so anyway, last year, literally, Sarah, I'm not kidding. After I, cause I was at my business convention when I saw your YouTube and then I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go get her books. I got your book on Amazon before I got home. It was sitting at my doorstep. I read it and I was like, I got to do a retreat. So the next month I did a retreat and it was all about soul sovereignty because you, mm-hmm. you led me down, even though I had read Marion Woodman and I had read all these beautiful, um, really enlightened, more like spiritual thought leader around the, what the divine feminine is, Andrew Harvey, mm-hmm. um, all of those people. I'm like, what does that mean for me? How do I personalize this? Because on my religious path, on my faith tradition path, it was all like, you should think this and you should feel that. And this is what you need to do. And then you're going to feel this way. And it never really culminated in any kind of personalization with the divine in a way that felt feminine. <laughs> so when I, my event coordinator, Jess, she's so hilarious. I was driving her crazy because she's like, I, I had planned to do this whole like course, you know, like, she's like, how do we, how do we monetize this for you? Like, you know, you got to lead them somewhere. And I'm like, I don't know. I just know I need to do this retreat. So I fill the room with these women and it ended up being a beautiful experience. And I pitched this three month program that I ended up canceling after the fact, because it felt like she goes, really, all that was, was a big coming out party for you. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, I know. (laughs) So it felt it, it felt really empowering to stand up to women and say, what do you think? Mm-hmm. What feels right for you? Here are what these feminine mystics thought. Mm-hmm. Here's what they tried to keep within their being as a sovereign truth. How do you, what resonates for you? So let's go back and circle to when you were a little girl, because I love your story. Yes, sure. um, how we got you to this point of where you're just like this blazing truth magnet for women who are trying to claim their soul voice. So you started on a very orthodox, in a, in a, you came into a family that was very orthodox, religious, correct? Well, they, they were Catholic um, and practicing Catholics. And, but I will say they have always been very open-minded and very, you know, encouraging for each of their children to think for themselves. So, you know, I did go to Sunday school. I went to a Catholic school. Um, I went, you know, to mass. And when I was a child, I was madly in love with God. I, I mean, I was <laughs> kind of like a little crazy kid <laughs> running around drawing like hearts on the top of all my homework assignments and like even on like walls around me and saying I love God and just you know when I would blow out the candles on like a birthday cake and it would be like what do you wish for my wish was God you know that was just like what I did <laughs> what I was just really uh, feeling quite strongly and you know for many people they would call this uh in the Catholic tradition and some other traditions, you know, a calling, a vocation. But when I went to my local priest, you know, and said I was having all these experiences and I have this deep passion for God and and I really want to be a priest. Like, I feel like that's what's happening. I'm being called. You know, they very quickly informed me that because of (laughs) my female body, Mm. I could not be a priest. Mm. So that this calling which was my own personal experience was being dictated as something else by someone, a man outside of me. Now, when I was younger, it just hurt. Like the way your truth, (laughs) the way it feels when your truth is being rejected, when your truth is being called an untruth. And it really broke my heart. Now, I stayed with the church for a while. Um, I did come across a book when I was in sixth grade. And this book was actually about reincarnation. And it was written by a very well-respected Yale psychiatrist um, who was an atheist. 
(laughs) And so I came across this book, I read it. And while I wasn't immediately like, oh, this is true or this is not true. What it did was it reawakened something into me that it reawakened the idea that this universe is enormous And that Catholicism, while important, and I respected it, and it serves a purpose and a function, was just one lens through which to view this universe and one way in which to experience this universe. Mm -hmm. So I ran to my local priest for a confession. Like I regularly went to confession, and I ran in, and I was so psyched, and I was like blabbing like a crazy person about this book and reincarnation and how our souls are on this like wild epic journey. And he, you know, there are so. I'm assuming he didn't receive it so well. No, you know, and I and I want to say there are probably a ton of priests out there that would have been like pretty cool with this young woman, you know, doing this and probably handled it a bit better. He just wasn't. He wasn't down with it, so he shut that down. And I remember I just left. I walked out of the physical church building that day and everything in my little body was like, I just walked out of the church. Mm. We're good. And I ran home, told my parents and they were like, you know what? We trust you. And as long as you find something to believe in, you know, we're going to support you. So that led me on this wild journey of just inhaling every spiritual book I could get my hand on, visiting every holy person who would come into town, doing any workshops and retreats I could. I then um, studied comparative world religions in college, and I went on to graduate school to study comparative world religions with a focus on mysticism and the divine. Harvard, no less. Yes, I guess. And then I traveled around the world so I could experience and study the lived reality of all these mystical traditions and all these people that I had the privilege to study. Um, That, after graduate school, moved to San Francisco, got immersed in a whole other arena of spiritual exploration, like the Bay Area provides for us. Mm -hmm. I used to live there. (laughs) So everything across the board under the form of spirituality or self-help or human development or energy work, I dove in. And this was also the time that I started to write my first book, The Red Book, A Deliciously Unorthodox Approach to Igniting Your Divine Spark. And I wrote this for young women because what I was really experiencing by this time was that no matter what teacher or tradition or holy text or workshop or practice or Oprah trend or whatever I was doing, well, I could find some truths and I could find some support in them. I still felt like something was missing. Mm -hmm. And part of what I was beginning to realize was it was the feminine, number one, but really underneath that as well was my own distinct divine authority, which I refer to as my soul. Mm -hmm. And so I was beginning to really get that because things just weren't filling in my heart the way that I knew they should. They weren't like fully, fully resonating. I was having a really difficult time finding my unique daily experiences reflected and validated and traditions or texts or teachers outside of me. Instead, what I was doing was I was trying to fit into all these different paradigms and do all these techniques and all these practices um, that were supposedly spiritual or good for me or holy or, you know, you name it. And so this pattern continued. My first book came out and, um, It had its own kind of surge of success with that. Um, And I also started uh, creating a feature documentary after that. And that is when I had the honor to interview the union therapist, Marion Woodman. Mm. And it was during that. I can imagine you're so lucky. (laughs) I was. I feel very lucky. Um, And you and I have talked about this together, but her book, Leaving My Father's House, is a must read for the awakening woman. Yes. Must read. <laughs> I'm also going to toss in there a pregnant virgin, which I love. Oh, I haven't read that one yet. Yeah. That's the first one I read of hers. And I was like, I don't understand, but my entire body is nodding. So I was like, that is a good sign. <laughs> what is happening here? <laughs> yeah. But it was during this interview with her, in fact, right from the beginning that I started to cry. 
and I continued the interview um, and I finished it, went back to my hotel room and couldn't stop crying. And what I began to realize on a body level, not an intellectual level, because see, intellectually, I was really familiar with Marian Women's beliefs. I had been very inspired by her. But there was something about sitting across from her and my body getting the chance to really like feel her body and feel her that made me realize that she was the first person. And mind you, I have been around a ton of teachers, mystics, gurus, thought leaders, like tons in my life by this time, and especially with all these films I was making to interview them. But sitting across from this union analyst, I realized this was the first woman, first person that I had ever experienced who had fully embodied their soul. And what I realized was that I had not. And in fact, at that time, I could not even feel my soul. I was super devoted to the divine feminine and like God and transcendence and the universe and all of that. But this unique, individual, distinct, and sovereign core essence of me, I wasn't in touch with. And I had lost it somehow. And so after Marion Whitman, um, I pulled back dramatically on my professional life. I stopped my film. I canceled my book contract. I turned down commercial offers. Just a whole host of things. Lost most of my livelihood. Because I, re I really realized that I could not continue to try to help others spiritually if I did not have my own soul, like really, really have it, not just know about it or believe in it or talk about it, but really have it saturate myself and my body. Mm -hmm. And so I took a lot of years um, to try and find my soul, to learn how I had lost it. So how old were you, sir, when you met Marion? And I was how, in, how far along in your scholarly work were you? My early 30s. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, this process continued. And from the process, I wrote two books. One, Red, Hot, and Holy, which was... I love that about, book. <laughs> yes, that was about, about this whole journey and really, really dives into me recognizing the loss of the feminine and the loss of my soul. Um, and at the end of the book, I really recognize that my, what I would call my divine soul. But the process wasn't done after that book. Um, and so I continued because for me, what I noticed was there was a divine soul part of me, this sort of distinct, eternal, infinite part of me. But there was also this human soul. And that's the part of us that I would consider um, that's here you know, on this earthly plane right now in a body and living life. And so going through a ton of pain and a ton of joy and wounding and trauma and ecstasy and you name it. And so what I realized was why I had a very strong connection to my divine soul. My human soul, soul was still missing, was still like not quite in my body. And so I wrote my third book, Revelations, about retrieving and reclaiming this part of my soul that I had lost. And I need to, I just have to tell, like, that book is not for the faint of heart, but I will tell you, it <laughs> went on my favorite book list of all time. I'm really not kidding. It is the most courageous, deep, honest um, work of literature. It's, it's amazing. I, I have it dog-eared like crazy, and I'll read a couple excerpts <laughs> in this episode for our listeners, but I just remember thinking, she's all, you are all of us. You, you, yeah. you had experiences that gave rise and voice to all of us, the awakening happening in all of us. Yeah. What we can't name. So revelations, I'm just going to just throw that bomb right now. Everybody <laughs> needs to go get it. And I love the, the byline of it, a soul's journey to becoming human. Um, one of the things you taught me, and then we'll go back to your story, is that we should be aware of anyone. And I can't remember if it was Red Hot and Holy or this book that you said that. But we should be really wary of any system or person who wants us to get out of our body. 
or wants to deny our body mm-hmm. or cast it aside as a thing of not or whatever you said. Mm-hmm. Do you remember what you said? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but it is, it is, um, I say variations of that uh, quite often. And it's the same thing, body, we can also say slash our humanity. Mm-hmm. So anything that makes us directly or indirectly feel less than for being human is something we need to really check. Mm -hmm. To me, it's a red flag. And unfortunately, most religions over the years, and I am a religion scholar, so kind of knowing the politics and the sociology and the economic drives behind a lot of these religious systems, often they stay in control or power by making us feel less than for being who we naturally are. Yes. And what's really interesting is they've written the feminine right out of the mix. Yes. So there has to be a correlation there, which you draw beautifully. Yeah. When you deny the human, you deny the feminine. Right. Right. That messiness, whatever that means. Yeah. The messiness, the body, the blood, the realness, the wildness, our sexuality. That's what really been wiped out. I mean, Jesus was like celibate, right? No, but they no. say he was. <laughs> Wasn't. <laughs> they just say he was. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not celibate. <laughs> exactly. And, and we will get to Mary Magdalene because... I didn't, she kept trying to come through to me my entire like life. Yeah. And there was one way she was explained to me and, and given just a very mere mention as the first person who came to Christ after the, or who Christ came to first after resurrection, which is a big deal, but it was still a mere mention. Mm -hmm. Um, And she's continued to try to come through and manifest in a myriad of ways throughout my life. And just within the last probably five years, and especially the last year, I've been like, I think I might understand now. As you said, it wasn't so much the, like, it's like, what is holiness? That's what I was trying to figure out in my logical mind. Mm. What does it mean to be a holy woman? Mm. What is that? And it was almost like she was going, it's not what you think it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So can, so continue on with your, with your story. Then. Well, no, that's really where the story ends because Red Pollutions <laughs> came out uh, last summer. And I'm really just, as, as you mentioned, it, it's a, um, it's a highly unorthodox book and it's the most vulnerable thing I've I've ever offered and I probably ever will offer in the written word. Um, and so I think just personally, you know, I've been recovering from both the process of birthing in and really going through everything I had to go through in order to sort of transmit my soul story into paper and to make it available to the public. And, and just, you know, the crazy ride that I think everyone goes through once they've exposed their truth and their soul. And they've actually shared something from their real voice. And so I've just, I've just been sort of recovering this year. It also kind of uh, dovetailed with a pretty shocking ending of a six year relationship for me and a move. And so it all happened at once, like the release of the book and the ending of the relationship and the move across country. And so a lot of me has just been, you know, trying to resettle and, um, yeah, just like, just recover. <laughs> I hear you. I'm yeah. right there with you. I actually, the timing of our call, I told you I was in fetal position a couple of days ago, well, actually yesterday, yeah. um, because um, um, my soul is, it, it's not easy when your soul voice wants to come out. It's, it's it, again, I keep coming to back to this phrase, but it's the only thing that fits. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, it, it feels like there's, there are transmissions trying to come through her mm-hmm. via us. And yeah. it takes a tremendous amount of perspective and courage to let it be what it wants to be and to let it express how it wants to express. Yeah. She wants to express. Yeah. 
Um, it's the hardest thing to do on this planet is to be ourselves freely and to share ourselves truthfully and to stay honest about our own unique experiences and dare to voice them even if they contradict or challenge the more dominant or popular or traditional voices around us. And that is why Magdalene is such a beautiful and helpful support is because as we all know, her voice and her story, her love has been greatly repressed on this planet. Mm. And even though, again, kind of putting on my little scholar hat for a moment, She is the woman most named, you know, in the New Testament. And she is at all the most important events. Mm -hmm. She has been repressed in a pretty massive and thorough. And again, as a scholar, when you really study this, a methodical way. Mm -hmm. And so... She represents that part in all of us, the feminine voice that's been repressed and suppressed and not respected and not seen as equal to or as important as the masculine voice or the masculine consciousness or way of knowing God or knowing this universe. Every single practice and tradition on this planet was created by a man So even the practices were based on male bodies and even the male brain and the female brain are different from each other. Mm. And so just what we have been given is half the story, which is really half our story. But here's, here's the third piece. And here's what I am. My work is devoted to is that what I began to remember and realize was that while the rise of the feminine is so integral and important right now and absolutely necessary. And so reestablishing Magdalene and all this new scholarship that's coming out and having her recognized as what she really was, a true teacher Mm. next to Jesus. So we've got these two powerful teachers, masculine and the feminine. Mm Mm-hmm holding hands next to each other. If you, if you think of, if you were a little girl and that was taught to you, how mm, different imagine. your psychology, your, I mean, everything would be that you had two equally powerful teachers, mm-hmm. embodiments of love here, one in a male body and one in a female body. It would, it would change. It's, it's, it would revolutionize a tremendous amount. But, but here's the piece. And here's something that I would say the real Magdalene. There's a lot of different Magdalene voices and streams out there. But what I would say the real Magdalene will always do, as will be real Jesus, is they will say, yep, develop this intimate relationship with us even further. And if Christianity is not your thing, to me, Jesus and Magdalene were not Christian. They were just natural humans. Mm -hmm. But if they have too much of a Christian slant, you can take it as the organic divine masculine and the organic divine feminine, the creator and the creatrix of this universe. What they will always, always, always do is point right back at you because there is a third piece. Mm -hmm. And that is the distinct sovereign soul of each and every one of us. And that that is the most repressed piece. So rising... Up the feminine is something we all need to do both within ourselves and in ways that we are naturally called to do. But what we cannot forget and what has to be combined with that is the reigniting of our own relationship with our distinct sovereign soul. And this is what I refer to in Revelations as the original Trinity or the Trinity of true love. Mm -hmm. And this is represented in what I remember, and this is where we get into unorthodox territory. But what I'm doing is just sharing my soul's truth. How do you keep continuing to foster that soul sovereign? Because like I feel the truth of that. And I know everyone listening feel, will feel it too. I'm, I can't speak for everyone. But I'm just making the assumption because I see the hunger 
in women's eyes. I see them wanting someone to give them permission that they're not getting from patriarchal regimes, from mm-hmm. systems, from institutions, from teachers. But but when how how beautiful is that that there's something pointing right back to you? And how do you how do you keep that alive for yourself? By being open to that truth. You know, I had to during my time after Marion Woodman, I went into what I call the red tent, mm-hmm. which was a kind of physical and spiritual space. Um, again, in order to try to understand how I lost my soul and how to find it again. And part of that process was a kind of spiritual house cleaning or a spiritual shedding, if you will, mm-hmm. where I had to really let go of all of these traditions and teachings and doctrines and practices and systems and things that I had both been practicing and studying and surrounded with, you know, for my entire life. And it was a very intense process and one that I know you can relate to. Oh and yeah. Other people can relate I'm to. in it, honey. I am <laughs> yeah. in it. it is no joke. It is no, no. joke. I now re- jokingly refer to it as a sort of like taking the red pill and like seeing through the <laughs> spiritual matrix and being willing to just let go, even if it's just temporary for some of us. But for me, it's 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 been more than temporary. But sometimes just to have that space where it's not being filled with all these different belief systems and shoulds and you know rules and no matter how helpful some of them might be or how great some teachers are out there or how you know powerful they can sound to us at certain points in our lives to have the courage to create the space to let it go temporarily or longer And just start to ask yourself, what is it that I as a soul know? Yeah. And start to pay attention. And a lot of the ways our soul communicates with us are through our very natural feelings, our body, our dreams, nature, synchronicities. But when we start to invite our soul to take more priority in our life, it usually will grab hold of that opportunity. Our souls have been waiting for this for a very long time. And this is soul loss is what Marion Woodman and Carl Jung and many others say. It's an epidemic on this planet, Mm. you know, meaning that most humans are disconnected from their soul. And what I've learned is the irony is most quote unquote spiritual people are disconnected from their soul because they've been so focused on spirit. And again, the sort of masculine perspective and a lot of practices and things that's taken them up and out of their body that suppress their femininity, their wildness, their naturalness, their unique voice and truth, all these things. Um, And again, this is not to slam religion or other spiritual practices. It's just to acknowledge that like they've, there's so many different roles, everything here on this planet serves and they both have some positive and wonderful qualities and they have some other qualities that don't always serve the human. And those can start to accumulate over time. And as you said, can really make us soul sick. And when I met Marion Woodman, from the outside, I looked like this raging success. I had books out. I had major deals. I was on the cover of the New York Times, you know, as a new role model of my generation. I was, everything was focused on just serving the divine feminine. Hmm. So from the outside, and I felt like everything I was doing was on target. So it really took kind of being in the presence of someone who had embodied their soul for me to get the like kind of slap down of, wow, yeah. <laughs> this whole other piece. I haven't met very many women. I, 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 I hesitate in saying this, but that is such a rarity to meet yeah. a woman who's fully embodied. I've met very Christ-like people or what we would term that from a Christianity kind of mm-hmm verbosity or whatever. It's like, oh, she's very Christ-like, meaning she's very compassionate and giving and loving and self, you know, serving and what have you. She's very selfless. Mm -hmm. I think what we're talking about is 
um, not to discount that, but I can also look in that woman's eyes and it's like, who are you though? Yeah. And it's kind of like, I was always taught that that was the way you just give everything away for everyone. (laughs) Like you, you give out, you wear out your life in that service. But, but then I think what happens is where's the, where is their soul? Where is their power? Where, where is that crystal look in their eyes where I know they're really here? They're not waiting for the afterlife. They're not doing all of these things so they can have some reward in the next life and have a miserable existence here. <laughs> no, <sighs> no, it's, it's a real, your spirituality um, often as I mentioned before, can really repress the soul. It, it's, it's, it's one of the main reasons, one of the main causes of soul loss, which again, I know is really paradoxical because there's some religions out there like Christianity that talk a lot about the soul. But what you are, but what I'm speaking of and what you're describing is something different than that. And often when we start to come back into contact with our soul and we start to embody it, we start to notice that our soul knows how to truly serve and truly love here in a way that will not deplete us, that will not suppress our voice, that will not exhaust our body, that will not enslave us to things. It knows how to be here fully, engaged with life, engaged with others, engaged with the divine, but it hasn't gotten the chance to use its voice and to really like show that because it's been so uh, kind of dumped upon, <laughs> yeah. you know, again, either consciously or unconsciously, not always out of, you know, po- negative intention, but just because so much of us suffer from a wound that we are not enough, that yeah. we have to do something in order to be divine that we have to be perfect ourselves, perhaps, that we have to be clear of sin, that we have to, you know, there's just all these things. And, it, and why this, this sort of system, why this works, why this lands in us so strongly, usually is because it's what I call sort of like the wound of incarnation, mm-hmm. which I feel every human has, which is just the wound of being here. Like it is difficult being a human. I want to read that part of your book because it's just a perfect segue for this. So um, you have a section in your book called Sacred Wound. And I'm just going to read this. Immediately, an inner guard forms a blockade around what feels like the basement of my being and the place I need to go in order to, quote, be human in love, unquote. I suddenly feel a trespasser in my own home. My consciousness is unwanted and setting off alarms. What's down there? I breathlessly ask my lady. And let's just tell everybody, your lady is your soul. That's what you call her. (laughs) Your sacred, and she answers, your sacred wound, Sarah. This is different than the wound of incarnation, which is the wound every soul receives when they first feel the intensity of being incarnate on earth. The sacred wound is more intimate and personal and actually inflicted by those closest to you. It is the wound of your wounds. Oh, is that all? I half jokingly respond and then mutter, no wonder I detest basements. You're funny, actually, that's funny. (laughs) To be human is to be wounded, Sarah. It is difficult, but important, part of life. While there are many uh, ways around your wounds, the way of love is through them. After years of working with Sarah, I had become more familiar with my wounds, but becoming conscious of my sacred wound, the wound that initiated all my wounds, feels almost unendurable and appears impenetrable. Not only is my inner guard surrounding the wound, but I sense a prowler to the demon. And then you go on to talk about the demon that hangs around your sacred wound and kind of relishes in the pain around it. So then different levels of pain, but basically... um, when you enter that sacred wound, you really enter who you are. You, you enter what it is you are. Yeah. And we've been taught to bypass that. Yeah. And that's why I think we experience, you know, when we really awaken, we're not awakening to 
oneness or unity and consciousness or anything like that. Well, that's super beautiful. <laughs> what we're actually awakening to <laughs> is who we actually are. Mm-hmm. Okay, so how would you define that? I'm just gonna, <laughs> it, I know it's esoteric, so I'm just trying, I'm just gonna like. How do you define the soul? Yeah, sure. Um, so, what I know the soul comes entirely from my own direct experience. And so while people like Marion and Woodman were very helpful for me, especially at the beginning of my soul journey, um, where my soul led me was kind of in the territories <laughs> that um, some of these soul teachers just didn't write about. So I, I was really on my own <laughs> for a lot of this. Mm. And I just want to preface that. Um, so for me, what I have come to know as our divine soul is this distinct, eternal, infinite part of us that is connected to all that is, you know, connected to what we might call the creator, the creatrix, or the universe, but is also different. It's unique. And this is where it's kind of a bit tricky for a lot of us who have been indoctrinated for a while into different religious systems because to recognize the soul as equal to but different than the very creator of this universe mm-hmm. is a big step. And it's something that I would never want anyone to take as a belief. Beliefs do not serve us in the soul realm. Only direct experience does. That's, that's a serious truth bomb. I hope everyone writes that down <laughs> because it, it's so true. And I think this was part of my shift, Sarah, was just realizing that I could read about what other people thought. And even in scripture, like I could look at what was canonized or what had been handed to me, or even some really high vibe works and channelings, all kinds of things. But ultimately, I wanted to have that union with the beloved. I wanted to have the direct experience. I actually pined and craved, pined for and craved it on a really deep soul level. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, again, all this is my perspective, you know, based on my experience, but I really feel that the craving and the desire for our own soul, our own distinct divine being is actually deeper and bigger and older than our craving for just to be united with the universe or God or goddess. That it's, it's the first craving. It's the craving that leads to all the other cravings. It's the desire behind all our other desires for everything, whether they're spiritual desires, whether they're more seemingly mundane material desires, whether desires for that, that partner, that career, like all of that, like the, when we go to the root of the root of the root, what I found over and over and over again, what had been missing for me after all these studies and travels and texts and practices and teachers, that none of which could truly fill that hole. Because that hole, that space, it's reserved only for our soul. Mm. So nothing else can fill that except for our soul. And our soul needs our permission, which is, again, one of these many funny paradoxes of the soul. It wants and yearns to be invited in, into our life, into our body, into our reality, into our consciousness. And so that's the the other thing that um, is a little bit different, perhaps, about my work compared to some of these other soul teachers, is that for me, this was like a hugely intimate relationship between me, human personality, Sarah, and my distinct divine being, my divine soul, who I call my lady. Like what was happening was this unbelievable sort of courtship over my entire life. But I started putting all the pieces together, which I write about in Red Hot and Holy. And I was like, oh my, like it's, (laughs) I've been calling myself, my own soul is the one who's been calling me my whole life. I thought it was all these other things. Yeah, yeah. But it was my own being that was beckoning me through whatever medium she could find to say, come home, come back to me 
this is real wholeness. This is truth. This mm-hmm. is true love. And it's through connecting and embodying with my soul that I have been able to so much more connect with this universe, you know, and what some people might refer to as God and goddess. It was like I had to grow and mature and individuate into my own being and remember who I really am in order to actually be of service here and not just give my power away to something outside of it, out of myself, but remember that it starts within and and then it extends out. Yeah, because I mean, when we talk about, and that's so empowering, by the way, that's amazing. Um, Everything that I was ever taught about what I could ever aspire to be is to be close to a male. (laughs) Right from the Holy Spirit on up. (laughs) It's always been a male. And if you, if you have issues of safety with men, which a lot of us do, um, even men have safety with men. It it feels more like, why not both? And, Mm. and really we are both is what you're saying. I mean, with that Trinity of true love, there's mother, father, us, or Jesus, Mary Magdalene, us Mm -hmm. from the organic piece. Um, and so we are that we, we are the stuff of the cosmos. We are the stuff of the organic and divine male and female, feminine, masculine. And so it feels like that that's self-evident to me now, whereas before I would have been like, huh, I don't know what I was talking about. And now it's just like, well, of course, yeah. of course. Yeah. And because we don't have a prototype of this divine feminine, which I now know is Mary Magdalene. She is the prototype. Mm -hmm. Um, at least from our mortal perspective, I always foresaw this, like when I, when I heard the term like heavenly mother or divine feminine or something, I always thought it was just this really like serene, who's that, (laughs) who's that lady from Lord of the Rings that comes I'm, I'm not like, you know what I mean? (laughs) I know who you're talking about. (laughs) Plays her. That's what I always thought of as just like the super peaceful, like, hello, my child, you know? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I just, and now I'm like, oh, she's kind of like all of us ladies. Like she's mama bear. She's spitfire. Yeah. She's she's volcanoes and earthquakes. And Kali is, you know, you talk about the goddess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, and now that's just so like affirming that it's okay to be human. Yeah, because the earth is technically human. <laughs> she's yeah. in her human state. And it's messy. It's creation is messy. And and the animal kingdom and all the mysteries. And, you know, it's just like, why would we want this narrow? And I'm just going to, I just got to read this one part of your book. And then we'll we'll kind of wrap up because I know we could keep going. Um, this is this is beautiful. This is um, right before the sacred womb part. Um, My lady softly offers, your soul's truth might be different than others' truth but it still has the right to be shared. So tell us more of your truth. And then you say, embers fly out of your mouth. (laughs) Embers fly out of my mouth. Uh, Embers from my heart fly out of my mouth. The church has um, us focusing up at him instead of also down at her and inward at ourselves. Most people can acknowledge that the feminine has been excluded, but if I'm also missing at that cross, then every soul is missing. Um, I think, that, and you said the church's crucifix is one piece of our whole truth. It's misre- a misrepresentation of the nature of the universe. How can we liberate and love ourselves, each other, and this planet if we have no real examples of the divine masculine in love with the divine feminine holding their divine child? I love it. <laughs> I, I think we could just like... That's the secret people. That is like, <laughs> we just solved world peace right there. <laughs> I didn't have to run in a pageant to, to do that. Like, it just like, but thank you for that offering. Um, I just never, I never saw anyone couch it in those terms and in such prose that just reaches in like that. I, and I also want to read this one part of Mary Woodman's that um, leaving my father's house. She's like, um, she talks about this medicine woman that came to her in dreams. She says, I'm standing in a dark fertile swamp where luscious March marsh marigolds surround me. My heart is full of life as Eve takes my hand and we dance in the dark moist wetness. She tells me 
to see the pure, clean swamp between my legs and then a lotus flower will bloom from it. Medicine woman appears and speaks to me. Through your vessel, the conscious feminine is to be born. Eve is to be brought into the sunlight. Though I am at an island in Georgian Bay and surrounded by beauty, I am filled with grief. I am my good Mary self with no voice, and I am Eve with no way of living my creative life for force. I am the woman whose son is dead and I hurt. Grief is vomited out of me. I hear others telling me that I'm not adjusting well, for it isn't right to spend my days crying. I am torn, angular, and wild with energy. There is no civilized woman in me, but there is a woman. I am that woman, and in my grief, I know what I value. I also know that healing for me lies in the salt water of my tears. So we are all that earthy stuff, that organic. And we cannot look past that to be who we are. No, no. Well it's, said. It's not. And can you hear the rain? I mean, yeah. <laughs> and Mother Earth is like, "Amen, sister. Here comes the salt water of my tears." <laughs> exactly. Oh. Well, I, I again, I'm so blessed to have crossed paths with you. I know there's no accidents there, and I'm excited for your retreat in July. Oh, thank you experience the soul fire retreat and uh is there anything else that you would that you feel called to share or end us with um well you just mentioned the soul fire retreat which is my annual women's retreat each year um in july and it's a very special retreat and i'm so grateful i'm so excited that you're coming it's Mm -hmm. i'm really it's going to be wonderful having you there and um for everyone you know listening just continue to trust yourself and your path like you really really know what's going on and you've got this and if anything in this conversation resonated with you just invite your soul in to continue to share with you your unique truth because we need it we need you here. Mm, beautiful. Thank you so much, Soul Sister. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me. So this rise of the feminine is here. It's the male body. It's the female body. The real Christ. The real Magdalene. Developing relationships to our own body. We are part of that trinity of true love. Mother, Father, us. That's the way it is here on earth. That's the way it is in the systems of the divine, if you want to call it that. You know, she talked about letting go of all systems. And I think that that's powerful because truly all we have is our direct link to the divine to know what our truth is. So I would encourage you on your path to continue to use your voice, to step into your power and to find that source and those reserves from deep within. Yoga was really pivotal in helping me to access that, to come back into my body and to own my soul sovereignty and still have that deep reliance upon the divine for guidance and flow and connection. Connection. Please continue to follow this podcast, share it with your lady friends and even men. I've got men who listen to this and I love it. I love that they have that feminine awakening happening within them because we're not just talking about women waking up. We're talking about the feminine in general, wake, waking up in men, waking up in women. So energetically, what you are contending with is a beast. Your soul is a warrior. It's true for all of us. We're contending with a lot because there's a lot to shift and there's a lot to wake up to. If you listen to Hira Hosen last week, she talked about the consciousness kind of ascending and rising as we head into 2020. Our bodies are feeling it. There's a lot of polarity. There's a lot of tugs and pulls and processing. Just love yourself into it. Take the time you need for soul rest and connection. You're worth it. I will talk to you next on Women Seeking Wholeness Wednesday as we head into part two of the Mary Magdalene series.